Okay, so let's, um, so as a first pass in getting started, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, clone my Git repository. So basically, as I said in one of the notes, and uh, hopefully you've gotten a sense for this a little bit already, I'm going to be posting all the material on this website called GitHub that uses um, a program called Git to basically do version control and um, save our work up online, uh, or save the materials up online for you to get them. So I'm just sitting here on my, um, on my desktop here on my, on my laptop, and I'm going to clone a copy of the repository. So each of you should be able to do this if you want to. You don't necessarily have to do this in re real time as I do it. Um, but I'm going to basically download all the materials that I've put up so far for the class um, from the repository, and then I'll have them available to work with me here today. So that should do it. What it's doing is it's just creating a directory and it's populating that directory with the materials that, um, that I've already posted to this site. So if I now go to the directory that got populated, stat 243 fall 214, 2013, I can see that there's a, folder for, there's a folder for the problem sets that has the first problem set in it. There's a folder for the class materials that has the PDFs and some demo code files in them. These are the things that I pointed out to you in the announcement um, yesterday. So all this material is now available for me to, you know, for us to work through here, but you can get it yourself as your own personal copy. Can folks in the back hear me okay? Am I projecting sufficiently? Okay. If I, sometimes I tend to have my voice sort of drop off as I get tired or something, so if I'm doing that, you know, just raise a hand and give me a holler. Um, so let's go ahead and open up the syllabus, um, which is in this syllabus folder, hopefully, presumably. Um, and we'll just walk through some of the highlights of that. Okay, so I'm not going to read through all this, um, but there is, some of this is, material is obviously more important than some other material, material. I urge you, there is some particularly important material in here, so I do urge you to go through this on your own. Um, I want to say a couple things about people coming into the class. So, um, many of you are master's students in the statistics program, uh, others of you are PhD students in statistics or biostatistics, and then there's another group of you who are, I think mostly, although I'm not sure yet, PhD students in a whole variety of different departments. Um, and if you are coming from another department, um, there is particularly the latter two-thirds, latter half of the class. We do do a lot with numerical linear algebra, with simulation, with optimization, where I'm going to be assuming that you know some statistics, assuming you know some linear algebra, assuming you know calculus. Um, so if you don't have that background, uh, you need to talk to me so that we can make sure that this is, this is an appropriate class for you to be in. Um, another option, if you're one of those people and you're particularly interested in the material at the beginning of the course, which is more sort of hands-on, practical programming um, material is that you could sit in on the class for however long you're, you're interested in the material. So that, that is another option and we can talk about that. Um, but that, the latter part of the course is where some people in previous years who come in without a statistics and math background sometimes uh, have, have rather more difficulty. Okay. Um, I am, as I said uh, to most of you who are already here, is anybody who's come in late um, Anybody who's not a statistics or biostatistics student not have one of these SCF computing account forms? Okay, so sort of folks in the back corner here. Are you raising your hand? Um, so if you guys can just, I'm not sure they're actually going to do that. If you can pass those over to folks who are raising their hands. Those of you who don't get one, um, I will try and remember to bring another few to class on Wednesday. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably the best thing. Okay, and what is also circulating is a sheet that, um, where you're supposed to mark off a little X to indicate when you are not available to come to an office hour so we can try and optimize when the office hour times are set. So if, uh, has anybody not filled out that sheet yet? Okay, so where are those sheets? <laughs> okay, so try and keep circulating those sheets and see that they get to everybody. And if you haven't gotten it by the, by the end of class, uh, uh, I'll try and remind folks then as well. Yeah, make, make very small X's. X's. Small X's, yes, indeed. <laughs> um, okay, so a, little, a few words about who we are. So my name is Chris Pechorek. The I is pronounced as if it were an H here. This is a Polish uh, name of Polish origin. 
Uh, please do just call me Chris. That way you avoid having to deal with my last name. Um, we're going to figure out office hours uh, in the next week or so, and be, I'll be holding office hours, and Tessa, the GSI, will also be holding office hours. Um, my background is in statistics. I have a PhD in statistics from Carnegie Mellon, um, but I've sort of worked my way into computing by picking it up on the side as, a, as, as I've sort of gone through my career. Um, so I do a lot of work in research in spatial statistics, environmental statistics, Bayesian statistics, but then I have a whole other side of my work where I do a lot of computing. Um, and in particular, I both teach this class. This is the third time I've taught the class. And I'm also on the staff in the statistics department as part of the statistical computing facility, providing support for, co for computing for members of the department. Uh, and we also provide support for members of the economics department. Um, so I have both sort of a statistics side to me and a, and a computing side to me and an, and an interface between the two of those. Um, so Tessa Childers Day is our GSI. Des Tessa, can you introduce yourself? Thanks. Um, let's see, a couple of things I, I forgot to mention. Um, I have, if we go to the GitHub site, I also I think sent a note around about this. Um, if you go to README, it's probably posted a few other places. Um, if you go to the README file, there's a little survey form that I'm hoping everybody will fill out. And the, basically, this survey has a bunch of questions about what department you're coming from, what your background in R is, what your ba background in Unix is, what your programming background is, et cetera, et cetera. So um, please do fill this out um, by next Wednesday, by the next class. A few of you have asked me to, to allow you to fill it out from your regular Gmail account. It's, it's gonna, I think it's going to be easier for me if you try and fill it out through Bmail, because that way you, I don't have to deal with uh, everybody's personal Gmail accounts. If you're really not able to do it through, B, through Bmail, let me know, but, but try and do it through Bmail, and, and that should be accessible to you. Um, oh, another thing I wanted to say about as we're going back to the syllabus and actually going back to the previous page on the syllabus, um, I'm going to be covering somewhat less sort of basic R than I have in the, the past couple times I've taught this class. And the reason is there's lots of other uh, important material that I want to cover that's important for, for folks in their programs here. Um, and also part of the reason that I held the R boot camp that I emailed you guys about, um, we held that last weekend, was to get people up to speed on R. And a lot of people already may, may be coming in with a fair amount of background in R. So the idea is we're going to do... Um, a fair amount of work in R and sort of more advanced aspects of R in particular and, and programming in R, but I am assuming that you know some R coming in at the level of basically sort of the first eight modules or so of the boot camp. So if, uh, if you want to see what it is that, that I'm more or less expecting that you um, be familiar with, um, I have the syllabus for the boot camp um, is up on GitHub as well. Um, if you have trouble finding it, let me know, but it's basically uh, should be readily available. And basically, I just have in the schedule for the, the schedule file for the boot camp, I just have a list of what the different sessions are. Basically, um, you know, sort of using R as a calculator, dealing with vectors and objects in R, managing R uh, objects in R, data frames, subsetting, working with strings, reading data in, vectorized calculations, um, getting, working with R packages a little bit, um, for loops, functions in R, um, doing things like regression and splitting up and stratified analyses. Um, and working with random numbers in R, and then a bit on graphics. So that's sort of, the, those are the sorts of things that I expect you to have some familiarity with. I'm not expecting that you know, you know, ex everything that we went through in these sessions in the boot camp, um, and you know, you'll have some time to pick some of these things up on your own um, and with our help as we, as we go through the first few weeks of the class. Uh, but just, just a warning to you that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to sort of cover R from the very ground zero. Um, and the other thing that we'll do, um, all of the material for the boot camp is available online so that you can do some self-study if you want to catch up or go back and review some of that material. Um, and in addition, uh, we, won't have a, we won't have class and we won't have section next Monday, but the following Monday will basically be a session with 
uh, Tessa in um, section to sort of go over questions about R that people have as they're getting up to speed and sort of reviewing reviewing what they've what they've known from the past. Okay, so um, let's see. Questions so far as I've I know so I'm sort of spitting a lot of stuff at you. Uh, any questions so far as I've uh, gone along? Yeah. Where are you supposed to what? Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that's basically you, um, for those of you getting these class account forms who are not statistics folks who are not already going to have an SCF account, so SCF is the statistical computing facility. We basically manage the computing for the Department of Statistics. If you're not in statistics or biostatistics already, you won't, you'll, you'll get an account just for this class. That's what those forms are, those sheets are that I just passed around. And basically, you need to go to one of the SCF machines. And those are available either just um, from the desktop, and as, just as desktop machines in Evans 342 or 432. Um, or you should be able to SSH. Um, and we'll talk about SSH in a moment um, to one of the one of the machines in the department. Um, an example of one of the machines is you could SSH to the machine baron.berkeley.edu, and then there should be instructions on those sheets of how to go about logging in and changing your password and whatnot, changing that initial default password. Other questions? Okay. The other thing I'll say about um, is that this class, when I taught it the last few times, it was much smaller. So there were about 30 students. So I'm still going to be trying to adjust and figure out how to work with a class of this size. Um, but I do want things to be interactive. I want you guys to be asking questions, um, raising, you know, making suggestions, um, providing your own input uh, as we go through the class. So I do encourage you to uh, give me a holler as, you, as thoughts occur to you or you have questions. OK, so sort of along the lines of, of asking questions, um, it's a little bit complicated, sort of how we're splitting up the material in the course. So basically, there are going to be three websites that have relevant material for the course. I said this in the announcement yesterday. The GitHub site is basically going to have all the material that I'm trying to get to you guys, um, material from the class notes, problem sets, problem, uh, things like that. Um, this Piazza site, which I, should, which I believe I enrolled most of you in, and so you should now have access to this. Um, if you don't have access to either BSpace or the Piazza site for the course, uh, send me an email and I'll make sure to, to, that you get set up with that. Um, but basically what, I, what we're going to do is do all of the, communi the online communication for the class through this website. And this allows me and Tessa to post announcements to you folks. And it also allows you guys to post questions to us either privately if you need to, to either me or to Tessa, or hopefully more generally just public questions and then and everybody can pitch in and answer questions. Um, so this is, the, this is the website that we'll be using for that. I haven't used this before, so there's going to be a little bit of a learning curve both for me and for you guys as we sort of get used to how we go about the mecha mechanics of, of using it. Um, and then the BSpace site, we're not going to use too much. Um, it is a good place to go because if you go to the BSpace site, there's a link to the GitHub site and there's a link to the, um, to the Piazza site. So this can be sort of a central place to go if you forget how to get to one other place. And what I will do is I'll also put a link to the R Bootcamp site. Um, from here on BSpace. So if, you, if you're not sure where to find the R Bootcamp site, you can, uh, you can go there as well. OK. Um, I have a bunch of information on the syllabus about um, supporting documents that you can get for supporting books and whatnot that you can get from the library in electronic form. There's lots of good material in there. Um, the core material I'm going to give to you in, in, a, in the form of a set of class notes, but a lot of this is going to be helpful if you'd like uh, some more detail, or if, if you think I presented it in a confusing way and would like to see another perspective on things. Um, you guys can read this. There's a little bit about uh, computing resources, um, a little bit about grading. If you have questions about that, uh, let me know. This is a graduate course, so things are you know, qualitative, um, and we're not too, too focused on exact, exact grading. But, um, and then I have some information on class participation here, which is I really want people to be participating in the class and engaging in the class. You know, it's hard to learn computing just by sitting back and having somebody talk to you. So you know, the problem sets obviously are a mechanism for that, asking questions in class, being engaged in the, the uh, discussion, any discussion that's going on the Piazza website. Uh, we're going to have a course wiki on GitHub. There's already going to be some material on that wiki from previous versions of the class from previous years. And the idea is to add to that material uh, in this, in this um, instantiation of the class. 
So basically, contributing in all these ways is, is a way to satisfy the, the class participation portion of the grade. Um, and then in terms of the problem sets, there's a lot of text here about how exactly I want you to, to submit, to, to, to work through and submit the problem sets. I'm not going to read through it right now, um, but there, there's a couple reasons for it. One is just if you're doing computing, it can be sort of complicated to make sure you've got both the text material and the computing results and the code all integrated into your solutions. And so I'm trying to provide a template and guidance on how I'd like you to do that. The other is that this is basically, submitting the problem sets is basically in the form, in the kinds of format and the kinds of ways of working on the problem sets that I'm asking you to do. It's basically practice for how you might do, write a journal article if you're going to be an academic or a report if you're going to be working in industry or presenting material on the web from a, from a, a statistical analysis. The idea is to, via the problem sets and via the formatting and workflow of the problem set, practice and you know, get, get into the practice of, of using good practices and doing these sorts of things. So that's why I'm being fairly prescriptive here. You know, I realize I'm sort of saying do it this way, but there's a reason for that. It's not me trying to be really picky and, uh, and anal about things. It's me trying to sort of get people into the habit of using good, good practices. Um, a little bit about grading that you can read on your own. Um, there's a, I plan to have a final project. Uh, this I'm still sort of working through exactly how that's going to work. Um, so we'll hear more about that uh, later in the semester. Um, and then I want to emphasize one thing about uh, there's a new campus honor code that is um, further down here in the document that I encourage you to go look at. The, the main thing I want to emphasize, because we don't have exams in this class, is what my expectations are of all of you in terms of um, working together on problem sets and submitting material for the problem sets. So basically the, the, the idea is that being in graduate school and working with your fellow classmates and colleagues is basically, you know, it's one of the things, places where you're going to learn the most being a graduate student. That's my experience, that's the experience of most people who go through graduate school. So I encourage you guys to be working together on, you know, you'll work together on the final project as well, but I encourage you to work together on working through materials, um, you know, if you have questions about material that comes up in, during the class, you can talk to each other as well as to Tessa and me. And you're welcome to work together on the problem sets in the following, and what I mean by that is as follows, that basically whatever you submit to me, that's code and your text answers, has to be your own work in the sense that you, you can't you know, get wholesale, get code from anybody else. You can't, obviously you can't copy stuff from, from other people. You are allowed to you know, talk about the problems and give suggestions to each other on you know, how to do particular pieces of the problem or particular tricks of you know, a few lines of code. So basically, the, the dividing line here is between making suggestions and giving, giving suggestions and comments about portions of uh, a problem versus basically copying entire problems and entire solutions. So you, know, you, you shouldn't be saying, oh, here's the work I did, and then handing it to somebody else and somebody else reading it and seeing what you did. But you can say, you know, hey, you know, for that part of the problem, you know, I used the sample function, and that turned out to be really useful. Or for this part of the problem, you know, I was using that function, and it turns out there's this particular flag to a Unix command that does this thing that was really helpful to me. And that's the sort of thing that you, that you can share with each other. So if you have questions about that, feel free to ask me. Um, but that's the basic, those are the basic ground rules for, um, for working together. And the other thing I encourage you to do is, and, and I you know, expect you to do is, you know, look through and start working through all the problems on your own. And then, you know, then get together as you're stu you know, on the things that you're stuck on and, and, and collaborate with, with your colleagues. If you're, if you're sort of, you know, starting out working on things, you know, with a group, just, you know, with a group without having to work through it on your own, you're not going to get as much from it because you're not struggling with it and, and really grappling with the material on your own. So before you start working with other folks, before you start coming to us with questions, you know, put, put a solid effort into it. And then as you, you know, with the things that you're stuck on, those are the things where it's good to start collaborating. OK, so I think that's most of what I want to say in the syllabus. I have here a list of topics. These, the times here are probably going to be roughly accurate because I've done the class a couple times and I have a pretty good sense of how long it's going to take to go through things. Um, but there, these may, may slip somewhat. And if you add these up, they might add up to more than the number of classes we have. So obviously, I'm going to have to adjust a little bit. Um, OK, so questions or comments about syllabus, logistics, any of these uh, sorts of things? Yeah. Um, is it expected or I guess maybe helpful to bring the laptop to class? Um, yeah, I think it could be helpful. It's sort of up to you. I mean, a lot of what we're going to do is basically working through the class notes in, as a demo. Um, and so if you want to be able to you know, type step in and follow along as you're on that, yeah, that could very well be helpful, but it's, you know, it's not required. So it's sort of up to you, whatever you feel is most helpful. Other questions, comments? Yeah. Do you have a preference in what kind of format we submit our problems 
Yeah, I have a, I have a pretty strong preference. Are you uh, the, for those of you in statistics? I want you to be using um, LaTeX and embedding your R code with either something called Sweeve or Knitter. Are you in statistics or not? No, but I like to use it. Okay. Um, if you're not in statistics, then if you want to use something called R Markdown, which is, which is sort of an HTML markup format that allows you to also embed R code, then that's okay. Um, although, you know, I'd also encourage you to, to learn some LaTeX as well. Um, and I have a lot of details on the syllabus about that, and, and there's some details on the first problem set about what I expect with respect to that. Um, and in fact, one of the quote-unquote problems on the first problem set is basically to um, work through what you would do for a, a general problem set of how you would write it up and embed some R code so that we can practice it. Um, you know, those of you in statistics or biostatistics, you're going to be using LaTeX in your other classes, so you're going to have to sort of get up to speed with it in this, you know, these first weeks and first during the during your first semester anyway. So this is just sort of part of that. Is yeah. Um, well, LaTeX is available for any all of the various operating systems. Um, there's a there's something called MicTech available for Windows. There's something called um, MacTech available for Mac, um, and then on Linux. Um, you know, LaTeX is available for Linux as well. Um, and so if you, I forget, I may have some information in one of the first units on that. If you're having trouble figuring out how to install it or something like that, you can, you can post a, a question to the class website and we'll, we, you know, we or other students will follow up from there. Um, if, you, if there is sort of a lot of, I'm not, I'm not asking you to use, to use LaTeX because I want you to do a lot of very um, involved mathematical equations, writing up mathematical equations. So in fact, if there is, there are still going to be some problems where you're doing a little bit of hand derivation. And for that, I actually don't care if you write it out by hand and just um, submit that on paper. Um, but you know, if you want to do that in LaTeX, then, then, that's, uh, then that's fine as well. The main, the main point with LaTeX is to be creating an, creating an entire document where you embed code in the document. And that's, that's why I'm having you guys use, use LaTeX. Other questions? Okay, um, so that's um, the the body of the here's the here's the campus honor code which I encourage you to um, look at as you're looking through the syllabus as well. Okay, so that's the that's the syllabus. Um, let's go ahead and open up the first unit and start working through the first unit. Um, so if I go back to the folder that I that is my local repository for for Git for the class, and I go to the lectures uh, directory. I'm just using, this is now a, basically a Unix terminal window here on my Macintosh. Um, and so the first few days today, next week, probably going into the first day or so of the week after next, um, we're basically going to be working through some of the basics of Unix to get you up to and familiar with working with Unix, working at the command line, working at a terminal session, logging into a remote machine, um, doing sort of, these are sort of the basics of, of scientific, pro, uh, scientific computing, scientific programming. Um, so, so already we're starting to sort of see some of these basic sorts of things by me just navigating around and starting to present, present the material. So ls is just a command that tells what are the files in a given directory so you can see what the materials are that I've posted in the lectures directory. So I'm going to go ahead and open up um, this first, the PDF for this first unit. Um, Sorry, yeah. ls stand for something? Uh, list, I think. Probably, yeah. <laughs> uh, where was I? Okay, so the, so the class notes are going to be basically in the following format. I'm going to sort of, some of the time I'll have the class notes up as this PDF. It's not in a nice slide format, basically because I want you to be able to work through it on your own, and I didn't want to have to make both slides and the sort of page-long document version of this. So this is not the sort of most user-friendly interface, but a lot of what we're going to be doing is the demonstration anyway. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the choice I made here. Um, and I'm not going to sort of, you know, talk through all of these sessions, uh, sections. I'm going to assume that, you know, you, that you're able to go, you know, that you go in and, and find the stuff that you need, and I'm going to highlight the key things I want to talk about in class. Um, so there's a bunch of information on how you would... Um, connect remotely to machines in the statistical compu uh, computing facility. Um, and so both in the how-tos folder on the, in, the, in the GitHub, uh, in the Git repository, and also there's a link here to a help page on, our, uh, on the SCF website that talks about logging into a remote machine. So the other thing I'd like to do for Wednesday, in addition to filling out the survey, is to get up and running on your SCF account, make sure that you're able to 
log in from your local laptop or desktop and SSH into a remote machine that you're able to create a file over there, copy files back and forth from your local machine to the remote machine, um, those sorts of things. If you, as you, if you have questions or as problems come up, post those to the, um, to the Piazza site and we'll respond and make sure that you guys are not running into roadblocks. Um, if you have troubles, trouble in general with, compute, with anything on the SCF, um, you can email any of these websites, either trouble at stat.berkeley.edu or consult at stat.berkeley.edu. This basically goes to me anyways in my staff position, separate from my teaching position. So um, you can, you know, if you're having issues, you can just also just go through the Piazza website um, as well. And that's, that's actually probably the best way to go to start. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what the structure of a... Um, a directory in, on a Unix machine, and by that I mean either an actual Linux machine or um, a Macintosh where you're interacting with the Macintosh through the terminal window because ever since OS X, uh, I always forget whether that's OS 10 or OS X, but anyway, um, ever since then the Macintosh has been built upon a Unix backbone. So a Macintosh is basically a Unix computer. It's just there's this graphical interface sort of hiding, hiding people who don't know about that from the fact that in the background it's actually a Unix machine. So a couple of things just to give you a sense of the sorts of things you can do. If, if I'm sitting here in the terminal window on my Macintosh, I can now re can remotely connect basically to any other Unix machine around the world that I have access to in terms of having an account via the SSH protocol. So I can do things like SSH um, to, say, the machine Baron, which is one of the SCF computers. And this is going to open up a terminal window into my home account on my my home directory in my SCF account. So all of these files and directories are sitting in my SCF account. They're run off the file server for the SCF uh, machines. And I can now operate, inter interact with this machine, which is called Baron, um, as if it's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't need to know that it's, you know, housed over in Evans and I'm connecting to it remotely. I can do things on it from, you know, from this terminal here. Here I'm just sitting here on my local machine on this Macintosh, and I can look at I can type PWD, and that tells me what the present working directory is, so what the current directory is in this particular terminal window. Um, I've sort of set up my my prompt here so that it also displays where I am on the computer. But you can see that um, I in within the users Pechoric desktop directory, there's this directory that have, holds this Git repository that has the local copy of my Git repository for this class, and then there's a lectures directory. So the way to think about uh, the directory structures on these, in these kinds of systems is there's basically a root of the tree. It's basically sort of like an inverted tree. Um, and at the root of the tree is the directory slash, and then below that is, are things like slash temp, slash var, maybe there's a slash accounts. And then when it, within each of these, there may be subdirectories within those and then subdirectories in those. So as you're navigating around the computer, have this image in mind of sort of going up and down through the tree and, and navigating through the directory structure. So we're already sort of fairly far down in the directory structure here in, when I'm in lectures. Um, If I want to get more details on the file in this, files in this and directories in this particular directory, if I do ls space minus l, that's going to give me a, a more detailed list of information on each file. It's going to say something about how big the files are. Um, so this is the size of the file. Um, and that should be in bytes, I guess. Um, this is when the file was last modified. This says something about the fact that I'm the owner of the file and I'm, I'm in a group called staff. Um, and this gives something about the permissions of who has permission to read and write and execute uh, the different files. And we'll talk about that more in a second. Um, so I can basically move around in this directory structure using the command cd. Okay, so I can, um, so suppose I were here, if I type cd lectures, that's going to change directory cd to the lectures directory. If I want to go up a level, then I can type cd space dot dot. That goes up a, up a level. If I wanted to go up two, two levels, I could type cd space dot 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 dot. That's going to go up from lectures up one level to the stat, the stat account and up another level to this desktop. Uh, sorry, direct, up, up one level to the stat directory and another level to the desktop directory. Um, another thing you can do if you just type cd without anything after that is it's going to go just go to your home 
to the to the root directory in your home directory. So this is now on my on my local machine. That's just users Pechoric. If I do that on one of the SCF machines, um, so let's say I have should have a research directory in here. So now if I type cd from here without anything after that, you can see that my home directory is sitting in some in on the general file system in account slash gen slash viz slash pechoric. So I can get back to that home directory just by typing cd. Um, and if I want to go to the last directory that I was in, I can sort of toggle back and forth between the most recent directory I was in and the current directory by typing cd minus. And so it looks like the last place I was was in desktop. And so when I, when I went um, up to my home directory and then typed cd minus, that got me back to where I most recently was, was which happened to be the desktop directory. OK. Um, questions so far about sort of directory structures and just moving around? Yeah. Um, can I say that a copy and paste some of the names of the files in the terminal? Yeah, you should be able to copy and paste into the terminal window. So if you have another, if you have a text file open somewhere else where you just want to copy from there into here, you can do that or vice versa. So you don't always have to type anything. Well, uh, I mean, if I use the LS, You mean copy a file from one place to another place? No, I mean, uh, I want to go to another, uh, another file, and I don't want to type this name, but it's this here. So can I simply copy this one? Yeah, I mean, you can just, you could just, you know, sort of highlight this and hit, you know, control C or whatever this command thing on a, on a Mac is, and then, and then paste it in, that sort of thing. Um, and there are lots of shortcuts you can use. I guess I haven't quite um, thought I was going to say that. But there are lots of shortcuts you can use. Like I'm going to hit Control A, and that gets me to the beginning of the line here. And I can hit Control E, and that gets me to the end of the line. If I'm at the beginning of the line and I hit Control K, that'll delete everything. And if I hit Control Y, that'll paste it back in. So I can, you know, if, if I just pasted this in and I wanted to change to that directory, I can do Control A, then type CD space, and then I can just hit Return. And so I, there are lots of shortcuts I can do. The other thing I can do is something called tab completion. So if I'm sitting here and I know if I do ls, you know, I can see there's this um, snap directory. If I just type cd and I, then I start to type st and then I hit tab on my machine, it's going to try and figure out what are the possible things that it can complete st with. So it, it, just, typed, it just added an a here when I hit, I hit type st and then I hit tab and it added an a. Because it knew that the only the only things possible the only, the only things the only files and directories on here that are possible at this point were sta because the only sts are our staff and staff and now if I hit another t and now I hit tab again it's going to complete the whole thing because the only thing that stat could possibly complete to is this whole thing because that's the only thing that starts with stat so if you're starting to type a long file name or if you're starting to type a long command like I, the other thing I could do here. Let's go back to my to the my SCF account. If I type MAT and then hit tab complete or MATL and hit tab complete, it'll complete it as MATLAB because that's the only thing that, that could possibly com complete MATL in terms of commands or programs that are on the system. So you can save yourself a lot of typing by by those sorts of tricks. Okay, other questions? Yeah. Um, well, you can either navigate using CD to get to that directory, or you can refer to that file with, with more information about the path to the file, about the directory sequence that goes to the file. So if I wanted to, for example, um, that's a good question. So let's, let's go up a bit. So this is, in the, um, this is in my home directory on my machine. So there's a file called test.html. So let's now go to um, desktop and to that stat. 243 folder. If I wanted to copy the file test.html from my home directory, I can do something like this. So what does all this mean? So this says copy this file, which is in my home directory, and the little twiddle and then the slash is shortcut for my home directory. And then copy it here. If I just put a dot, that sort of means here. So this will copy a copy of this file to this particular directory, this stat243 directory. And now if I type ls, you can see that this test.html now shows up in this directory. Similarly, I could, have, I could have referred to that file as 
slash users slash Pechoric slash test HTML, and I could have copied it in that, for, in that manner as well. So you basically can give any absolute uh, path to a file. You can also give relative paths to a file. So if I could, for example, have also done copy dot 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 test HTML. So this says, okay, I'm currently here. This says go up a directory, go up another directory, copy the file, test that HTML that's two directories up, which is the same thing as this file, because that's this two directories up goes to this place. Again, copy it here to my local directory. Yeah? Does it just yeah, it's just continually overwriting it. In this case, it's just overwriting it with the same file. There's another question. Yeah, you have to know where the file is, right? There's no magic. You know, this is true on any machine. You have to know where to go. Uh, only if the file name is in the directory where you're currently residing. Yeah. Um, you know, on, if you're on a Mac, you're actually even on Linux these days. You can open up a Finder window, for example, or on Windows, the equivalent of this, and um, you know, look through it in a graphical interface, but this is, you know, this is how you do it from the command line, and that, this is operating from the command line is what we're going to emphasize a lot. I probably should have said that a little while ago. You know, you might think this so far, this is kind of tedious, but the nice thing about this with the tab completion and whatnot is actually it's, it's quite fast to do things once you get familiar with it. And the other thing is when, you, when, we, when we're able to do things by typing things out, we can then embed lines of, of operations of code in a text file, and we can recreate a whole series of operations that we did. And this is this idea of being able to reproduce everything that we do. Um, and, and we can both automate, we can, there are lots of things we can automate. We're going to talk about doing about that uh, over the next week. And we can recreate what we've done before. So instead of, you know, if you, need, if, you, if you go through a whole series of operations where you're pointing and clicking, and then you realize, like, oh, you know, I needed to tweak something at the beginning of that set of operations, you need to go back and, you know, re-click through all of the different things that you've done. If you've written things out, in text and saved it in a file, all you need to do is go back and just execute that entire file and then it'll just execute everything you know, without you having to go through and do any hunt, uh, pointing and clicking. So the idea of this is both automating things and being able to reproduce things and being able to disseminate what you've done in a way that people can see exactly what you've done. So what if um, uh, we have two files with the same name and, and in different directory? Uh -huh. If we use the tilde, the first one that you show the tilde, the test option, so which one do you call? I think you just get an error, error message. Well, this this tilde and this slash user slash patrick is referring to the same place. They're both referring to my home directory. So this file and this file are exactly the same thing. Oh, okay. And I have I, in each case I copy the file to my local directory. This so this directory and this at this path, and I'm just overwriting it here. Oh, so it's it so it depends on where, where you, you, you locate it. Uh, you yeah, you can have files of the same name in different places, and we're just putting things in different places. Yeah, good question. So I could have done, instead, you know, suppose I didn't want to overwrite test.html, I can do new test.html. This is going to make a copy of test.html that's called new test.html. And now you can see that new test.html is now in the directory. In the directory that you're currently in? In the current directory. Or I could have, if I really wanted to, I could have said, done something like this. Oops. So even though I'm in this directory, this is doing everything two directories up. I'm making a copy of this file. And with this new name, two levels up. Yeah. So you can do everything with what I call this is an absolute path because it tells all the way from the root of the tree all the way down to where I want to go. Uh, where am I here? So this is an absolute path. This is a relative path because it's relative to where I currently am. Okay. And then you know uh, something like the dot is just you know happening low, happening within the directory I'm currently. Okay, so that's, that's CP. Um, I should have mentioned, actually, I probably should have opened this. Um, that's the best way to open this. I guess I will open this in Aquamax. Um, so all of this, all of these, um, essentially all of these commands that I've been executing um, are in this demo file of demo code, so you guys can can work through this on their own. I'm, I, I haven't said all of these things, but um, this gives some more information, basically. 
Um, and one other thing to point out about Unix, let me make this a little bit bigger, um, is these things after the space with the minus are basically flags. They're basically arguments to the, to the functions that allow you to tailor the behavior to what you want to do. Um, so we already saw that ls space minus l. Um, This, this, this P flag is basically going to preserve the timestamp. So if you, if you had modified a file a long time ago and you now copied it over and used minus P, that would preserve the timestamp so you could see that you just copied it. You didn't actually change the time that it was noted that it was, that it was modified. Um, the minus R should do things recursively. So if you want to work with file, a whole set of files in a directory, you often use this minus R um, flag as well. Um, if you want to remove a file, can do rm or rm minus r or rm minus f sort of forces the removal without. Um, so if I just do rm test.html, oh, I guess on this machine it does that. If I'm on here, this is on the SCF uh, machines. Uh, if I were to do rm unzip.sh, it asks me, do I really want to remove the file? So if I, if I did, don't want to have it ask me that, I can do rm minus r. Or uh, rm minus f, which stands for force, and then it's not going to ask me about removing the file. It's just going to go ahead and do it. So there are lots of these different flags that um, that are useful for tailoring behavior. If you want to make a new directory, you can do mkdir for make directory. So I could make a directory called temp. And now I see that there's a temp in here, and I could cd to that directory, and I can see there's nothing in it because obviously I just made it. Um, if you want to know how to get help on any particular command, this is going to be something you'll be using a lot as you're you're getting used to this. Uh, the help command is basically called man for manual. So I could do man cp, and it's going to give me a whole bunch of information about how do I use the cp command. So it gives a little bit of a synopsis, which is maybe sometimes a little bit hard to, to um, parse until you sort of get used to this, but it gives you some idea of what are the possible flags or arguments, and then the fact that it's expecting a source file that it's copying from and a target file that it's copying to. So there's sort of a, uh, a description here. And then as you page down, in this case, I'm using the space bar to page down, um, it'll give all of information about all of these various flags. So in some cases, you might know there's a minus F flag, for example, because I told you. And if you want to go get a little more information about what exactly it does, you could use the man command. Or if you don't know what all the flags are and you think, you know, it's, probably, it's possible or plausible that copy might be able to behave in this particular manner, you might start looking through here and see is there some flag that will allow me to do the copying in the way that I want to do it? Yes? This is all case sensitive, right? Yeah, Unix is all case sensitive, so it matters whether you type lowercase cp, uppercase cp, et cetera, and as well the flags as well. Yep. OK, a uh, couple more things. Um, if I want to copy stuff from my local machine to, yeah, question. How do I what? Undo a copy or a remove? Yeah, you can't undo or remove. Uh, so be careful. That's why on the SCF machine, it asked me if I really wanted to do it. Because if you remove it, it's gone. If you're on the SCF machines, things are backed up every night. So try not to do this too much. But if you remove something you really need, we can, we can go retrieve a copy of it from a previous day, for example. But in general, if you um, if you remove something, it's gone. So be careful with remove. Yeah. You also install one of those um, graphical file transfer. Yeah, there are also graphical file transfer um, programs. I'm going to show you how to do a file transfer just from the command line. Um, but in Windows, there's something called WinSCP. Uh, I imagine there's something for Mac, but I actually can't tell you off the top of my head what it is. Um, yeah, and the, oh, the other thing I should mention, if you're in Windows and you want an, a client that will allow you to do the SSHing like I'm doing here to SSH, log into a remote machine, there's something called PuTTY, P-U-T-T-Y, so that's a useful uh, program that you can get. So let me exit out of here. That's going to get me back to my local machine. This is now me just sitting here on my Macintosh. I'm going to SSH to an SCF machine, in this case to, to Baron. Um, the minus x is a nice flag that you might you will often want to use because what that's going to allow me to do is open a graphical window that's being run by the remote machine and open that window on my local machine. So if I wanted to open up, say, um, an Emacs window or a MATLAB window or an R window that's not just a terminal window but is actually a graphical interface window, 
if I wanted to run that from the remote machine and open it up and see it on my local machine, I need to have the minus capital X flag. And that basically allows me to pass what's called an X terminal through, uh, through to my local machine. OK, so I've, I'm logging in. I can you know, see what's here. If I want to copy a file um, from this machine to somewhere else, I can use the SCP commands. It's going to be easier in this case. It's a little hard for me to copy to my laptop because I don't know what the name of my laptop is on AirBears uh, on this network. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy something from the remote machine to this Macintosh locally. So I'm going to do something like SCP my username on the remote machine at a name of a machine at the name of the machine I want to copy from. So this is just going to be I can copy from any of the SCF machines. All of them have access to my home directory into the file system. So there's a machine called Bilbo that's easy to type, so I often will use that. And then I would do berkeley.edu, and then I would say colon, and now I can start typing the path to the file that I want to copy. So if I type tilde, that's going to be my home directory on the remote machine. And so, for example, I could type, I have a research directory. Let's see what I have in my research directory so that, so that I know that there's something there for me to copy. Uh, that's weird. Oh, right. Um, CD research. All right, so there's an me.tech file. So I have some tech file related to some project I was working on. So I could file, copy that file to this machine, to the current directory, or let's, let's copy it to the home directory and the desktop of, in the home directory on my local machine. So this SCP stands for secure copy from the remote machine, from this directory, and this file on the remote machine, to this directory on the local machine. If I could reverse this, if I knew the name of this local machine on the network, by um, I could do SCP from the local machine and the path, and then I could put the remote machine as well. So I can go either you know either to or from with this kind of syntax. So if I do that, it'll give me a little progress bar. This was such a small file that the progress bar just basically completed right away. But it tell if it were taking a while to copy, this would march from zero percent up to one hundred percent, and it would tell me how fast it's transferring and things like that. Will what? Um, probably not because it's not going to. At least for the remote stuff, it's not going to know what's on the remote machine magically. Yeah. Question. Do I have to put in the host name every time? Yeah, you always need to give the name of the machine. If you're on the Berkeley network, you wouldn't need to do .berkeley.edu, so that would save you. Yeah, you could just do at Bilbo. If you're at home, you know, wherever you live, you're not going to be able to do this in general, but. Yeah, question back there. If you have uh, huge files, which may take a very long time to download to anywhere, do they save the computer hyperlinks? Is that the way to stop the transfer? Is there a way to stop the transfer? Oh, will, will it? Um, if you close your machine, it'll stop the transfer, yeah. I think, yeah, I should, actually, I should have looked into this. There's a command called rsync, R-S-Y-N-C, that I think might allow you to copy part of it and then re-pick up the copying. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer off, off the top of my head. RSync might allow you to, to do something like that. It might be more robust to large files. OK, so we're essentially out of time here. Um, so we'll pick up here when we come back. Before you guys start rustling, just to make sure I get uh, a couple things across, do fill out the online survey of who you are in the, read, that's the link from the readme file in the GitHub repository. Um, and do start practicing with, with getting your SCF account up and running and being able to copy a file back and forth and whatnot. And do that for Wednesday. And, and no class on Monday. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. And if you did not mark an X in that office hour survey of when you are and are not available, come on up here and um, mark off when you're available for off to come to office hours. So now I just walk into my um, I just remote. Yep. So if I want to copy a file, like let's say, okay.